All right, good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming today. Um, just a few housekeeping things uh, this morning. Uh, first, the usual uh, disclaimer about CME, and again, for those of you who are uh, wishing to earn CME credits for attendance, please make sure that you've signed in either today or at the uh, teleconferencing sites that are joining us this morning. Um, the past lectures are now being posted at two different places, so I just want to make you aware of this. First, on the NIH video casting site, you can go to this very long URL here, or easier it would just be to go to our own uh, course website at genome.gov slash course 2010, follow the links to lectures on the web, and there is a direct link to this page, and you'll see the last two lectures have already been posted. All you have to do is just click on play video, and that will pop open the viewer, and you'll be able to watch it, the lecture. So if you uh, have missed a lecture or want to catch up or just review some of the concepts, please feel free to take advantage of that. Another source where you can get the lectures is Genome TV. So this is a new uh, channel that the Genome Institute has put up with a variety of uh, lectures. So here you can just see there's a, uh, a sequencing group busily working, uh, preparing a lot of the samples that we end up talking about in the course of this lecture series, uh, in this case from the clinical sequencing effort or ClinSeq. Uh, Eric's lecture from the very first week is right here under the featured column. We're having a uh, new ch um, playlist put together so you can just find all of the lectures all in one place there as well and just works exactly the same way as if you had gone to YouTube. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and get into this week. We're going to just pick up where we left off last week about how to talk about how to further analyze sequences primarily at the protein level. And, and as you'll notice, we've concentrated quite a bit at the protein level, and this may seem a little bit odd for a course that's called Current Topics in Genome Analysis, but uh, we do this because we want to reinforce to you the importance of thinking at both levels, thinking at the DNA level and thinking at the nucleate, at the protein level when doing your analyses. Obviously, advances in genome science make it incredibly easy, much easier to find mutations, chromosomal aberrations, look at changes in expression patterns, um, and similar um, events taking place at the nucleotide level, but we need to translate those events that are taking place at the nucleotide level over to the protein level to keep in mind that the proteins are actually a workhorse in the cell. And so by going through all of this material, for those of you who are focused more on the basic research side, this will hopefully help you think about your experimental design a little bit better and advance your understanding of how these mutations at the nucleotide level affect things like structure and function. For those of you thinking of clinical questions, you might have detected a mutation in a patient, and you might have been doing some genetic susceptibility testing, some other targeted sort of testing, and you need to understand the net effects of those mutations in your patients to better understand why am I seeing the phenotypes that I'm seeing, to start to get some insight into metabolic changes that might be taking place in those patients, and to help determine which mutations are potentially pathogenic. So this will, in turn, help you hopefully start to think about therapeutic approaches. So yes, we are focusing primarily today on the protein side of the house, but I just wanted to drive home why that's important. So, um, sorry. So we're going to talk today about um, things like pro profiles, patterns, motifs, and domains, so talking about protein secondary structures. Uh, we're going to move to the three-dimensional level, so going away from just looking at strings of letters and now looking at three-dimensional structures. I will tell you about an analysis tool that's very easy to use and a three-dimensional viewer. And finally, we're going to end up talking about multiple sequence alignments, and this theme will come up over and over again in the rest of this course when we start to look at the genome browsers and other techniques that are available to us to do advanced genome analysis. Okay. So we'll start with sequence comparisons once again. And the approach that we used last time around was um, homology searches, where we did these one-against-one searches, taking a sequence of interest and comparing that against a uh, set of sequences, probably in a public database, to find other sequences that are similar to the one that we started with. And the method that we spent most of our time talking about last time around was BLAST, but I also mentioned to you another tool called FASTA. But again, one-against-one comparisons against a large collection of sequences. We can also take a slightly different approach and uh, look at the collective characteristics of protein families to find com um, similarities between protein sequences. Now, these searches, is, searches can be one against many, and I'll tell you about several uh, 
approaches to do that, or many against one, where you've got a collection of sequences where you're trying to find a new sequence of interest, and I'll tell you about a BLAST-related method that can do that. So we're going to start with the one against many and talk about profiles. So a couple of definitions, again, to start off today's lecture. Whenever I talk about a profile, a profile, just quite simply, is a numerical representation of a multiple sequence alignment. So I can take any multiple sequence alignment and represent that as a matrix, the same way that we talked about our scoring matrices last week. Those, uh, if you'll recall, we talked about the Blossom series of matrices that were derived from multiple sequence alignments. And using those alignments, we came up with those matrices that conveyed to us things like when conservative substitutions could take place and where uh, important residues had to be conserved. So these profiles, like last week, depend on patterns or motifs that contain these conserved residues, and they represent the common characteristics of a protein family. So because of that and the power of using a collection of sequences as your basis for comparison, we can start to find similarities between sequences that have little to no sequence identity. So I offer to you an example uh, to make this point. The homeodomain sequ um, uh, family, if you look at the homeodomain, 60 amino acids across, but only a handful of residues, there are less than 10, are con conserved amongst all of the sequences in the class. And if you were to use BLAST, which we talked about quite a bit last week, you wouldn't actually find all of the homeodomain sequences that are in the public databases. So we need to add some additional tools to our arsenal to help us find additional similarities and make additional biological uh, conclusions where BLAST won't quite get us all the way. So more, more things to put into your toolkit. So yes, there is. So I uh, mentioned last week the definition of similarity is when you have your identical residues plus conservative substitution. Okay, so those, that is considered sim. So you have a percent identity and a percent similarity. And again, the percent similarity includes conservative substitutions. Okay, so how do we actually construct one of these profiles? So again, the profiles are based on multiple sequence alignments. Here I have a multiple sequence alignment. There's a number of sequences here, 10 across. You'll notice that I've highlighted some of these positions in red. So the last position, you'll see that there is always a glycine residue in the 10th position. You always have a uh, threonine in the 8th position. If you look at the 9th position, most of the times you have a proline, but sometimes you have a threonine thrown in as well. So we're going to take a look at this, and we're going to ask four questions. We're going to see, OK, what residues are seen at each one of the positions? So we get an idea of the frequency of amino acids at each position, what's allowed, uh, what is the frequency of those observed residues, which positions are conserved, either outright absolutely conserved or just conservatively, um, where we see conservative substitutions, and finally, where we can introduce gaps. We don't have any gaps in this particular example, but gaps can certainly exist in these alignments. Based on those four questions, we can construct something called a position-specific scoring table. And this table, all of these numbers in this table, represent the answers to those four questions. So let me take you through this. You'll see across the top, you have each one of the amino acids. Going down the side is the consensus at each position in our uh, multiple sequence alignment. So here we have position one here. Position one is at the top of the table. Position 10 is at the bottom. So we basically just turned this alignment onto the, its side. Now you'll remember that there's always a G in that final position in position 10. If we look at the G here, and if we look at the G in the amino acids going across the top, look at where those two intersect, we see a value of 150. And 150 is the largest number in the table. So anytime you have a position where that residue absolutely positively must appear, you are going to assess a very, very high positive score. So drawing the analogy back to the blossom tables last week, anytime we saw a uh, conserved residue, we always gave those conserved matches the highest possible score. Let's consider now the next to last position. Again, most of the times we have a proline, but sometimes we have a threonine. We'll take a look over here at the P and see where it intersects with the P across the top. And at this time, it says 89. So not as many as the 150 to reflect the fact that this is a conservative substitution. These residues can substitute for one another. 
It would be better to have the exact match, but we want to at least allow for that wiggle as well. Finally, let's just take a look at the second position where you've got just about everything going on. The uh, consensus here is a proline. If we look across to where the proline is, we have a much lower positive score, okay? So your best scores arise when you have an exact match of that residue at that position that is absolutely conserved, and then the scores start to go down as the positions become less and less conserved. Now, fortunately, you don't have to generate these. These are all generated for you. Um, and um, you can now use these and compare your single sequence of interest against hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. So in essence, this takes the place of a sequence. So the same way last week that we used BLAST to compare sequence A to sequence B, now we're going to say, okay, I have sequence A. Sequence B is my collection of these position-specific scoring tables. Okay. Second definition is something called a pattern. So in the case of the profiles, we have two types of information. We have positional information, what residues can appear at a given position, but we also have frequency information, which is captured in that table by all of those numbers. Here, we just have a shorthand to represent to us what residues can exist at a given position. So we have no frequency information here, just what is allowed where. Now, not exactly intuitive how to interpret this, so let me take you through this. So at the very beginning, we have a phenylalanine and a tyrosine in square brackets. What the square brackets convey to you is one of. So in position one of that motif, you have to have either a phenylalanine or a tyrosine. In the next position, we see an X. So the X means anything. You can have any amino acid at that position. We then see a single amino acid, a cysteine, with no embellishments around it. So that just means you absolutely have to have a cysteine at that position. Again, here is the X, but now the X is followed by a two, so that just means two of them. So any two amino acids in a row. All right, now, again, two amino acids here, valine and alanine, but instead of the square brackets, we have the curly brackets, so it means the opposite of the square bracket, so it means anything other than a valine or an alanine. So not valine, not alanine at that position. Again, the X, so any amino acid. And finally, here are the same notation we've seen over here. So here we've got a histidine, the number three, so it's just three histidines in a row. So this defines a pattern that matches every single member of that particular class of proteins. Okay. So a little bit different approach, but both of them are quite useful. So let's go ahead and put these both into practice and talk about our first database of the morning, and this is something called PFAM. And so PFAM quite simply stands for protein families, and it's just a collection of these profiles, these multiple alignments of protein domains and conserved regions. So hopefully these represent regions that have either some sort of structural significance or some sort of functional importance. When we look at these entries, and we'll see an example in a couple of minutes, we'll see the multiple sequence alignments of the family members, we'll start to get a sense of domain architectures. And so when I use that term, all that means is what is the series of domains that I see in a particular protein, the nature of the domains and the order of the domains. Um, I'll get an uh, idea of which biological species have uh, proteins that meet, that are members of that particular class, some information on known protein structures, and links to some other databases as well. Now, there are two types of PFAM entries. The first one is called PFAM-A, and these are the better of the two options. In prior versions of the documentation, this had been, uh, the analogy had been drawn between PFAM-A and a handcrafted beer where somebody lovingly put the uh, uh, multiple sequence alignments together to make sure that that particular profile was indeed accurate and biologically relevant. So these are based on curated multiple alignments. A method is used to find all of the detectable protein sequences that match that particular family. So someone has gone ahead, made this multiple sequence alignment for you, generated um, the, uh, the scoring matrix, and then searched the databases to find all of the other members of the family. Um, so because of the way it's done, because of this handcrafted method, the hits that you find to PFAM-A are more than likely true positives. PFAM-B is a slightly different approach. This relies on strictly on automated methods. So because of that, that is deemed to be lower quality. But you should certainly look at those because you might have a situation where you've done a query, 
you don't find a match to PFAM A, but you might see something to PFAM B. So again, using the handcrafted beer analogy, PFAM A is like the Stella Artois, while PFAM B is more like Natty Bo. All right, so um, to remind you, uh, we're going to go through all of these examples as if we are sitting at the computer. As with last week, if you'd like to go back to your labs or back to your offices and repeat what we're doing in class this morning, you can go to this page. All of the sequences are on this page. You can just cut them, paste them into the boxes, and follow the steps that we're going through. All right, so let's go to the PFAM site. As always, I will give you the URL at the top of the page. Um, so we've gone off to the Sanger Center in the UK, and here are just a very simple front end. What we're going to do is do a sequence search, but while we're here, let's take a look at what else we have. You can, uh, I love the name of this, Bjork clan. So you, can, so you can see some groups of related uh, families with deference to the Scottish people that work on this database. Um, you can jump directly to a particular protein family if you know the name of that protein family. So it's just a simple keyword search. But again, we're just going to go ahead and do our sequence search. So if we click on the words sequence search, we get a box. And so we could quite simply put our sequence in that box. But as uh, you have come to learn, I like to look at the, uh, the options that are available to me. So to see what parameters we can change here, there is a very, very unobtrusive link here that just says uh, perform a range of other searches here. You click on the word here, and that will now expand this out so we can see what's available to us. Okay. So. Here is our sequence box. I've gone ahead and pasted in the appropriate sequence from our list of sequences. Um, but we have just a few options here that are worth talking about. The first one is called cutoff, and it is automatically set to use E value of 1.0. Uh, so that is the default um, value. But keep in mind the guidelines that I gave you last week for protein sequence comparisons, because that's basically what we're doing here. Even though we're using these matrices, it's still a protein-protein comparison. So in the back of your head, keep that 10 to the minus third guideline in, uh, in mind as you look at the results. What gathering threshold here means is that it will automatically, if you want, adjust that E value to use the same E value that was used to construct each individual scoring matrix. Um, so if you have a reason to do that, that's fine, but I usually just leave that as is. Really, the most important thing here is to just click off this search for PFAM B's box, which is unclicked by default, but we do want to see those results even though they are of lower quality because there might be something interesting there. So we'll go ahead, click on Submit, and see what we get. So what we get is something that looks like this. At the very top of the page, we have an overview of our results, so it just says we found three PFAM A matches to your search sequence, one significant, two insignificant, but we didn't find any PFAM B matches. So we're only going to look at one hit here. We then have a representation of what was found. It's marked P450, so this sequence that we started with had a cytochrome P450 domain in it. You'll notice that the left side is rounded and the right side is jagged. So the left side being rounded just means that our sequence lines up with the beginning of the motif for that particular protein domain. But the jagged part means we didn't get all the way to the other end. So this is partial overlap with a particular domain, in this case, P450. All right. If we now look at the tabular results, again, cytochrome P450, our sequence aligns with the domain starting at position 41, ending at position 500. To see a little bit more detail, you'll see in the red box here, it says show or hide all alignments. So if you click on the word show, this just basically expands the page. So instead now what we have here is the alignment. And there's a number of lines in this alignment. This might be easier to see on your handout. Your sequence, the sequence that we started with for the query is the one that is just labeled SEQ for sequence. The HMM in the first row is the actual consensus from the profile that it matched. So that is the actual uh, P450 profile represented as a consensus sequence. The next line down where it says match is just quite simply which positions match. So you have a qualitative, just a visual overview of how good those matches were. Same rules as last week. Any place you saw see a um, exact match, you see the letter repeated <coughs> on that line. Any place you see a conservative substitution, you see a plus sign. All right. And then that final line, PP, just stands for posterior probability. So this is just a uh, quantitative measure of how good the match is position by position 
to this particular um, position-specific scoring matrix, and the rules for that are in the documentation right above that. So, okay. Now we searched for PFAMB, we didn't find anything. Let's go ahead and just now go to the entry where the more interesting stuff actually is. So this is now just a summary page for a um, motif, and again, in our case, this domain is the P450 domain. It starts off with what I like to call an executive summary, and we're gonna see a lot of these as we go through this morning, and what these executive summaries represent is someone who knows this particular entity, in this case, this protein domain very, very well, who knows the literature inside and out, is more than likely an active researcher studying these proteins, has written for you what they think the most important things you need to know about this particular protein domain are, okay? Anytime an expert is willing to take the time and do that and share that with you, you should absolutely take advantage of it, okay? Right below it, you'll see that there are references going back to the primary literature, so again, the executive summaries are very important. They are not a substitute for reading the literature, but they will at least direct you to what are the more important papers to read in the literature. So there's a little bit of a judgment there are as to which papers are important and which ones maybe not so much. All right. Let's, um, let's see. On the right-hand side here, we have a sample structure. And when you do this, it will just randomly pick one of the structures that has this particular domain in it. Um, if you want to see different structures, you have a pull-down menu right below where you can switch to other structures. Now, we're going to take uh, advantage of two links at the very top of the page, and you'll see it says 152 architectures and 18,883 sequences. So let's start with the 152 architectures. So remember, when we talk about domain architecture, we're talking about the order of domains in a particular protein or in a set of proteins. So the very first one in this list tells us that there are 16,000 plus sequences that have a P450 domain in it, all right? And right below, you'll see a button that says show. So if you clicked on that button, you can actually get all of those sequences, collect those, store them uh, on your hard drive and use them for some other sort of analysis. So a very quick way to just all at once get a complete data set of, in this case, all of the proteins that have a P450 domain in them. So if you want to go off and do a phylogenetic analysis or anything like that, it saves you the trouble of doing the blast searches, compiling them, editing, doing all of that. As we go down, we'll see that there are other architectures that are part of this family. So right below, we've got a different architecture, P450 times two, where you've got two P450 domains next to each other. A little further down, P450 times three, so you've got three next to each other. And other domains are mixed in in some of the other lines as well. So again, good tool to have in your arsenal, especially uh, going back to how we started off this lecture thinking about why protein domains are important, why it's important to think on the protein side of the house. Let's say you have a mutation, that mutation may fall in one of these domains. So now, have you obliterated the domain by that simple point mutation or uh, deletion or what have you at the nucleotide level? If you're thinking at the, at the clinical level, do you have a mutation that knocks out some residue that's important for um, some sort of, again, metabolic process, something that is relevant in a structural or functional domain that might explain why you see the phenotypes you do in your patients. So something else to think about as you consider things at the protein level. Now, the other link at the top, 18,000 plus sequences. So let's take a look at what we see if we click on that. If we click on that, there we go. All right. And so here we can actually see pre-made alignment. So you'll recall in our handcrafted analogy, someone has put together a seed alignment, that initial set of sequences that were found that were members of the P450 class that were used to find all of the other members of the class. So I could see just those 50 in this case that were in that seed, or I could see all of the sequences that make up that particular uh, protein family. In this case, I'm just going to leave this set at the seed so I don't get anything unreasonably long. And if I want to look at these, I can just click on the View button, and what I would get is a multiple sequence alignment that looks like this. So we're going to come back to this at the very end of the lecture when we talk about the viewer that allows us to manipulate multiple sequence alignments, but the colors mean something, the histograms all mean something, and I'll tell you about all of that a little bit later. 
All right, so now let's say we're sitting at our machines again. We're going to pretend that we've gone back to the PFAM page. And so we're on this page. We're going to pretend that we're scrolling down. And when we get to the bottom, we see a number of external database links. And the one that I want to focus on is the one here where it says ProSite, and then there is an accession number. And if I click on that accession number, I, come, I leave the Sanger Institute, and I now go to the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics, uh, where they have maintained for many, many years a database called ProSite. And so this is a collection of protein profiles, those profiles that I told you about earlier that just tell you position for position what <coughs> amino acids can exist at a given position that characterize a given set of proteins. And so in this particular case for our P450 domain, we see the consensus pattern right there. And now you know how to read that, how to make heads or tails of that. So you could use that as a basis for comparison. The more important thing I want to point out on this page is, once again, yet another executive summary, and more importantly, the name of the person who put that together. Whoops. So if you now have questions about this particular protein domain, these people do make themselves freely available to members of the biological community. So you could just click on their name, send them an email, and if you have a question about this, these particular proteins, they will answer that question for you. So it's always nice to have that person at, uh, available to you when you've got questions that you just can't find the answers to in the literature or from your colleagues. All right, let's pretend we've gone backwards again. And so we're on this page. We clicked on uh, this link here at the bottom. I just want to focus your attention a little bit further up the page where it says Interpro Entry, another accession number. And if we click on that, that now takes us away from PFAM and over to another database at the Sanger Institute. There we go. Um, called Interpro. And Interpro is, in essence, what we call a secondary database. So there are collections. This is a collection of information that is amassed from a series of other primary databases. So ProSite is an example of one of those primary databases. There are, there are other databases that talk about protein domains and similar uh, characteristics of proteins. What Interpro tries to do is just collect those for you all in one place. So it's one-stop shopping. So again, we are looking at cytochrome P450. Um, the first thing I want to draw your attention to here is something called the Interpro relationships. So what this set here, you'll see it says children. So the children are sub-members of the class. So these are, uh, these are sub-families that are part of the bigger cytochrome P450 family. So they are more specific members of the class. So we've got a B class, an E class, various groups um, of cytochrome P450 proteins. Because the ch children are always more specific than the parent. If you have a match to the child, you have a match to the parent. Okay. So they, by definition, have to overlap. Uh, yet again, we've got another executive summary here at the bottom. We have some um, gene ontology term annotation, so we can see that this particular uh, domain is involved in um, iron-iron bonding, binding, heme binding, and so on. Again, let's pretend we're scrolling down the page. I will get used to this. All right. And uh, here we have a very funky representation. And th what this is intended to convey to you is the taxonomic coverage of this particular domain. So put otherwise, what organisms have some protein in them that have a P450 domain? Uh, you do not read anything into the lengths of the branches or anything. This is not a phylogenetic tree. It is just a representation of which organisms have P450 proteins in them. So the center of this tree are, are just, is just the root. As we go further out, the, um, the inner nodes um, are the tree nodes. By the time you get to the outside, you'll actually see names of representative organisms like mouse and human. The numbers represent how many proteins in that organism have a P450 domain, at least how many characterized sequences. It may not be the absolute number of, of sequences because you may have sequences that have been documented two, three, four times. But if you click on those links, again, you can download a sequence set and use them for some other purpose, possibly doing a phylogenetic analysis or something else. Okay. Again, let's scroll down. And we now have another way of looking at domain architecture. So in this case, we've got um, a little bit different representation. So what we have here is protein by protein, various entries that were found. 
that have this P450 domain. So in this case, we've got a protein having this accession number. The protein is represented by the red bar. The domains are shown underneath and the colors that correspond to what each one of those domains are is shown at the bottom. So a little bit of a different way of looking at what domains comprise a particular protein. Okay. All right, so putting all of that together, um, I want to point to you to two additional uh, things that I'd like you to read at some point. Again, these come from current protocols in bioinformatics, so this is uh, the work that I'm editor-in-chief of, and what I want uh, you to look at specifically are two units. The first one is on a much deeper treatment of PFAM. The other one talks in great detail about Interpro. What's nice about these units, for those of you who have not uh, looked at the current protocols um, in bioinformatics units before, it's very similar to current protocols in molecular bio biology, immunology, and the rest, in that it is protocol-driven, hence the name. So you, there are examples that you can work through, so just print out the pages, sit next to your computer and just step-by-step step follow the instructions and it will teach you hands-on how to do this, okay? You can only learn a certain amount by watching me walk you through these examples, okay? The only way you're gonna really truly learn how to do these is to put hands on keyboards and actually start to bang away. So it's very important that you spend some time uh, trying to do these techniques in practice. To remind you, this is available uh, to all of you through the NIH library free of charge. So all you have to do is just do a search on, on online journals, type in the name, current protocols in bioinformatics, and that will take you directly to those listings. All right, before we leave domains uh, altogether, I want to point out to you an NCBI uh, tool called the Conserved Domain Database that uses a slightly different method. So like some of the other things that we've seen, this is a secondary database, so we can search everything that's in PFAM and uh, A and B. We can search something called SMART, the Simple Modular Architecture Research Tool, clusters of orthologous groups, which is a collection of, of protein families put together by Eugene Kunin at NCBI and some other resources as well. Now, in the interest of making sure you don't use these things as a black box, I just need to point out that the searches here are, you, are performed using something called RPS BLAST. So this is a variant of BLAST, or reverse position specific BLAST, where your query sequence is used once again to search a series of those position specific scoring matrices. Same general idea as what I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. However, the actual methodology, the actual algorithm that is used is different than the one that is used by PFAM. And many times you will do searches where one of the two tools will give you one set of results, the other tool will give you a slightly different overlapping yet slightly different set of results. So take home message when you want to do these kinds of analyses to see what kinds of protein domains exist in your proteins of interest, do both, all right? There's always um, comfort in consistency between the methods. All right. So let's, again, pretend we're uh, at the keyboards and take you through an example. So this is the CDD homepage. There's a very long URL here. It's actually easier to just go to the NCBI homepage and look for the structure link off of the homepage. But if you want to type that in, there it is. Um, here, we don't have any options we can throw. It's just a box. And we have a choice of which databases we can search. So from the previous slide, we could search any one of those individual databases or we could just search them all at once. So that's what we're actually going to do and just leave it at the default. The sequence we're using here is the deleted for in colorectal carcinoma uh, gene sequence, excuse me, protein sequence from human. All right. So let's say we've put that in the box, clicked on submit. This is what we get back. So it's a little bit reminiscent of the BLAST results we saw last week in that we have a representation at the top of our um, our protein hit. So our protein is this one going from 1 to 14. 47, and you'll see below each one of these boxes represents one of the domains that was found in this protein. And I'm going to focus in on this very first one, which is called the neogenin domain, which is also the first one in our list of hits. So in this hit list, you'll see the definition line, just a brief description of what that particular found uh, domain is, a um, identifier which we'll come back to, and the probability value. So again, same guidelines as last week apply, 10 to the minus third, because we're doing a comparison at the protein level. If we want to see a little bit more about this first hit, all I have to do is click on that plus sign, and that will actually expand this out, and I can actually now see an alignment. 
So in this alignment, I just have a, a sense of how good my sequence of interest matches this particular domain consensus. So my sequence, the human DCC sequence, is in the first line. So in my sequence, positions 41 to 136 lined up with the domain. Every place you see um, position marked in red, that's an exact match. Everything else is either a conservative substitution or a mismatch. Um, so just at a glance, you can see most of the positions are in red, and that bears well for this being a true positive. And again, here is the probability value, which gives us the quantitative measure of good, how good our hit in this case is. If I want to learn a little bit more about this particular neogenin do domain that we found in our protein of interest, that's where now this number comes into play. So this accession number is in a column that is labeled PSSM, Position Specific Scoring Matrix, ID. And if I click on that ID, that takes me to an expanded view, something called the Conserved Domain Database at NCBI. Again, a quick summary of what is known about this um, particular domain, the references that support that particular description, so you can go back to uh, what are uh, deemed to be the more important papers on this particular domain. If I scroll down a little bit, we have a representation of how this domain relates to other domains. So there's a hierarchy here. Um, we're just going to bypass that. I don't find that to be particularly useful, but I just want to point it out to you. And, but most importantly, at the bottom is the sequence alignment. So very quickly, you can see how, what this alignment looks like, who the other members are of this particular class. Once again, you can download these sequences to use for some other purpose in some third-party software, and there's a link off of this page that describes to you how to actually do that. Okay. So with that, I want to now flip the analogy around. So at the beginning, we said we can do our searches one to many. So in this case, the one was our sequence of interest. The many was either our profiles or our patterns. Let's flip that around. And now what we're actually going to do is construct a profile to enable us to find distantly related proteins related to the one that we start with, the one that we're interested in. And the way we're going to do that is by using a tool called PsiBlast. And the Psi just stands for Position Specific Iterated. And this is incredibly easy to use. So let me tell you how this algorithm works. In step one, all we're going to do is do a BLAST P search the exact same way that we did last week. We take a sequence of interest, change the various parameters that we want to change, click on the Go button, and it will just do that BLAST P search. Once we get back our list of hits, okay, it's going to take that hit list, and everything that is above our probability threshold that we're going to set, it will take all of those sequences in the hit list, construct a multiple sequence alignment, derive the position-specific scoring matrix, and now use that matrix as the input for the next round of searches. So we started with a single se sequence. We ended up with a position-specific scoring matrix. We throw away that initial sequence, okay? And again, just use these matrices that will be recalculated round after round until we've identified all of the members of that particular class. So hopefully we will come to convergence where all related sequences are deemed found. If we keep going round after round and the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger, uh, at some point you will, ha will have uh, brought all of GenBank into your query. So your query at that point is deemed to be a little bit too broad. Uh, so what you have to do is just use a shorter region uh, and make your cutoffs a little bit more stringent. That rarely happens, but something to be uh, mindful of. All right, so how do we do this? So hopefully this now looks familiar to you. Again, here is the URL that takes you to the BLAST homepage. Our protein-based searches are here under the Protein BLAST link. So again, we will click on that as we did last week, and this will take us now to the BLAST homepage, okay? As we did last week, we're going to paste a sequence into the box. In this case, this is a DNA binding protein, a high mobility group protein that we're looking for. And let's take a look at some of our options. The first thing we get to do is choose what database we want. The same options are available as last week, so we could pick RefSeq, which was the curated database I told you about last time around. I also alluded to SwissProt, so let me tell you about that this time around. So the same way that RefSeq 
at NCBI is intended to represent each molecule in the central dogma once and only once, so you only have one entry for each DNA sequence, mRNA sequence, and protein sequence. Swiss protein is intended to do the same thing, but only on the protein side. So this is only a collection of protein sequences. This is a longstanding 30 plus year effort that has been going on at the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics. What's nice about this is that by definition, of course, these are non-redundant. There's integration with other databases. There's ongoing curation of these entries by external experts. So this really relies on active experimentalists in the field to keep these entries up to date. And more importantly, when you look at the feature tables in these entries, you'll see a bunch of comment lines. So yet another executive summary by the active investigator in that field. So again, do take advantage of those resources whenever they're available to you. To discern when you do a BLAST search which ones of your uh, hits actually correspond to a Swiss prot entry. When you look at that accession number, and again, the accession number is the unique identifier, the sequence is social security number. In the first position, you will see either an O or a P or a Q, followed by five numbers. So when you see that, an O, a P, or a Q, followed by five digits, that means that that is a Swiss prot entry. All right, so let's go back to our search. I selected Swiss prot here. And the reason for doing that is quite simple. Because this is a non-redundant database, we're going to just get a nice, tidy list of results back. We won't have uh, multiple hits on the same sequence. All right. As before, hidden below the blast button, algorithm parameters. So if we click on that, it'll expand the page open. Let's see what we have here. Um, so the very first thing we have is how many target sequences do we want to have returned back to us? The default is 500. I just, as a rule, set that to the biggest number it'll let me uh, set it to, 1,000. You'll recall last week's example, if we left this at the default, we actually would have missed things in our hit list. So just set that number as high as you can. Um, the expectation threshold, the E value, our measure of whether something is a false positive, the default is 10. I'm going to go ahead and use my guideline of 10 to the minus third or 0 0.001. Again, remember those are guidelines. Those are not absolutes. We're just going to use that as a starting point here. Um, we should, again, filter the low complexity regions. So these are those homopolymeric runs that I told you about last week, where you've just got stretches of the same letter. Those tend to confound the blast searches. So we want to just mask those and not consider those as part of the, the sequence searches. Finally, at the bottom, something we didn't talk about last week, we now have a section of this page that is specifically geared towards these side blast searches and something else called a five blast search, which we're not going to talk about today. Let's say you already had a scoring matrix and you want to use that as the, as the input for your search. You could just upload that. If you found it maybe on some other uh, database, you could use that as the input for your first round. We don't have that, so we're just going to go ahead, use our one sequence of interest, set the Cyblast threshold at 0 0.001 as well. The default here is 0 0.005. There might be a virtue, actually, to making that a little bit higher because as with last week, we want to take a look at what might be on either side of our cutoff line using our biological knowledge to say, which ones do I want to include, which ones don't I want to include. All right, finally, just my personal preference to make sure that you've checked this show results in a new window box to make things a little less unwieldy on your desktop. You go ahead and click on blast, and off we go. All right, so now this looks like what we have seen again last week. Our sequence, 1 to uh, 215 in this particular case, it has found two matches to conserve domain. So there are two HMG boxes in this particular protein. And you'll see once again our, our very busy scoring table that we talked about last week showing a graphical representation of all of the hits that were found based on our initial query. Okay, if I now scroll down to where the descriptions are, just to remind you how this is oriented, you'll always see the accession number at the beginning, which is hyperlinked. If you click on that, it will take you back to GenBank. You have a short description of what that particular um, protein that was found actually is. The score for that, and if you click on that, that will take you down to the alignments. Remember, the scores are less important here. The probability values are what I want you to always look at in the E value column. OK. Now, let's, um, what you'll also see here, which you don't see in a regular BLAST P, BLAST N search, is 
in the very beginning, the word new. And you might see one of two things in that position, and the key is here at the top. If you see new, alignment score below the threshold on the previous iteration. Well, we didn't have a previous iteration, so everything is marked new. But as we go through the successive rounds here, anything that is carried over from the previous round will be marked with a green dot. Anything that was found that is new in the new rounds will then have the new label next to them. Let's move down to the bottom of our hit list here. Um, it says here, run side blast iteration with maximum, once again, a thousand sequences returned. What will now happen, just to remind you, is we throw out our initial query. We have a position-specific scoring matrix calculated based on the things in this list. You can include all of the things in the list, hence all of the checkboxes. But again, here's where your biological knowledge comes into play. Maybe you see things on towards the bottom of this list that do not belong. If they don't, because you have some other piece of information, uncheck the box, all right? And that way it will not be included in the next round. Go ahead and click on go, and this will go around as many times as it has to, and you will just have to wait for it, and you just keep clicking on go, and you go two, three, four, or five. In this case, you will go around 11 times until you finally reach convergence. And you know you have reached convergence when you see the message at the top, no new sequences were found above the 0 .001 threshold. So at this point, we can have confidence that we have found all of the members of this, in this case, high mobility group class of proteins that we can find using this particular method. To drive home why this is a powerful technique that you should have in your arsenal, if you recall, in, in round one, I don't think I pointed this out, we had 132 hits. By the time we got to round 11, we had 180 hits, okay? So we found 48 additional sequences that we would not have found just by using our traditional blast search, okay? So very important, especially if you're dealing with proteins that have not been highly conserved over evolutionary time. The things where there are, there's a lot of evolutionary pressure to not have mutations, to not have changes, you're not going to really pick up anything by using Cyblast. But for most classes of proteins where there is wiggle in these classes of proteins, it's worth taking the time to do this extra set of searches to see what else you can find. So this hopefully demonstrates now the power of using the collective characteristics of the protein family to find things that we wouldn't have otherwise found. Okay. So with that, we're going to leave things at the sequence level behind for now. And we're going to move into things at the three-dimensional structural level. And I know most people tend to do this with a little bit of trepidation because I think we all have in the back of our heads you know, the, the image of the geek down the hall with the Coke bottle glasses and the big machines with all the dials on them and, and just structure as being something impenetrable, something that is just hard to understand because of the technology that's involved in generating those three-dimensional structures, trying to figure out what Fourier transforms are and all of that. What I want to show you this morning is you actually don't have to concern yourselves with how we got the actual structures, but there are some very easy to use tools that you can use to now answer questions about structural similarity. And the reason I, I want to make sure that you know about these tools is because of that very basic tenet that Chris Anfinson back in the 1950s won the Nobel Prize for. Sequence specifies confirmation. This was battered in all of our heads in basic biochemistry. But confirmation does not specify sequence. The converse of that statement is not true. So you might have multiple structures where you see similarity at the structural level, whether it is in a particular domain or across the entire protein. But if you look at the underlying sequences that make up that protein, you might see very, very little sequence similarity. And there are cases in the literature where that percent identity goes down to the 10, 11, 12 percent range. Why is that important to you? When you do your BLAST searches, BLAST tends to start to fail below 25 percent sequence identity. This has been very well documented in the literature. And as you recall last week, I gave you a 25 percent rule as one of your criteria to use for determining biological significance of your BLAST hits. So when you start to enter that territory where BLAST is no longer the tool of choice, now this is the thing that you should be have in your arsenal ready to go to find things that as I put here on the slide, cannot necessarily be detected through traditional methods. 
All right, so again, a little bit of background on how this works, and this is actually pretty cool. So what we're going to do now is compare every known protein structure to every other known protein structure. And to give you a sense of the size of that problem, as of this morning, there were 62,000 entries in the protein data bank, PDB, uh, and 58,000 of them represent protein sequences deduced either by NMR or X-ray. Now, to do a comparison of one structure to another structure using the most robust methods that we have takes on the orders of order of weeks to months, depending on how much computing power you have. Now, if you multiply that out, 58K by 58K, you have now entered the realm of the computationally intractable. So we need to make some modifications and make some simplifications in order to make this a more approachable problem from a computational standpoint. So the way we're going to do this is, well, this is done for you, uh, so you understand what's going on. We're going to take each one of these 58,000 protein structures. So here's just an example of a particular structure. Uh, we see a bunch of uh, uh, blue bits. So the blue bits here are the uh, alpha helices. The green lines represent the beta strands. And what we're going to do in the first step is just get rid of all of the loop regions, anything that does not exist either in an alpha helix or in a beta strand. So that's what we have in the second part of the picture here. What the method then does is for every alpha helix that it finds, it passes a vector right through the center of that alpha helix to approximate the path of that helix, keeping in mind which end is the N-terminal end, which end is the C-terminal end. If it sees a beta strand, it will just do the same thing, draw a vector that approximates the path of that gable, that beta strand. Once that is done, all of that information is thrown away. So by the time we get to the last step, every single atomic coordinate has been thrown out, okay? But based on those coordinates, we now have a series of vectors. For each one of those vectors, we know which one is an alpha helix, which one is a beta strand, which end is the um, N-terminal end, which end is the C-terminal end, and which one connects to the next one in the series, okay? That is now going to be the basis for our comparison, and this now turns into a glorified game of pickup sticks. So we now have here, for the example, two protein structures, protein 1 and protein 2. The first one has four secondary structural elements. The second one has five. For argument's sake, we're going to say they're all alpha helices, just to make this easy. We're now going to overlay these every way we can to find out whether or not these are structurally similar to each other. So in the first alignment, we might take all four of these secondary structural elements, overlay them with the four secondary structural elements, the four alpha helices from protein 2. And what we would see is, well, they're all going pretty much on top of each other. They're all going in the same direction. Of course, this is done much more robustly than this. This is not done by either actually mathematics behind this, but I think you get the idea. Basically, if we see something like this, we would deem that to be a good match of the two structures over that region to one another. Let's take another alignment where you might take all four of these alpha helices from protein 1 and now comp um, combine those with 1, 2, 3, and 5 from protein 2. So as before, 1, 2, and 3, all going the same way, pretty much the same path. Five is off doing its own thing, so we would not consider that to be a good alignment. And that is just done over and over again, every possible combination that the computer can come up with. It does its math in the background. And what you end up getting at the end of the day is something looking like this. In your handout, skip ahead one slide, so the next two slides have been transposed in your handout. This is remarkably good, okay? These are two protein structures that have been deemed similar to one another by this FAST method. Keep in mind what we just did. We threw away all of the atomic coordinates. We're comparing these series of vectors, but yet these two structures pretty much overlap each other almost perfectly. Now, I sort of pushed it in this case where I picked an example where there's only one mutation between the two, but what you see time and time again is just an incredibly good match between the structure that you started with and the other ones that are found in uh, PDB using this vast method. All right, and we're going to come back to this representation in a moment. So just to remind you of some of the caveats of the method. 
By definition, because we've thrown away all of those atomic coordinates, it is not the best method for determining structural similarity because we've lost a lot of information along the way. So we have less confidence in our prediction. But regardless of the simplicity of the method, it is a great first approximation. And I will show you in a minute, you can do this yourselves right at your desktop. So if you find something that has promise using this vast method, you can then maybe seek out somebody who's a structural expert to say, all right, I want to delve into this a little bit more um, and, and get some help in that direction. But this is something that you all can do yourselves. All right, so how do you do that? So we're going to go back to the NCBI website. And so this is the NCBI homepage. We're going to use the Entree search engine in the upper right-hand side to do our search. Uh, in the search pull-down, I've selected structure. I'm putting in an accession number so that I get back one and only one entry. In this case, the accession numbers in PDV take the form of a number and three letters. So the one I've used here is 2LIV. While we're here, let me point out the structure link here as well. So if you want to get to the conserved domain database that I showed you a few minutes ago, instead of typing in that long URL, you could just click on that as well. All right, so search structure for 2LIV. You click on the search button. And that now takes us to our results page. We get back one and only one result, which we would expect because we've used an accession number here. And so here is just a little pictogram of the structure that we found, the accession number. It tells us that it's a paraplasmic binding protein um, that is called a leucine, isoleucine valine binding protein. If we want to learn a little bit more about this, all we have to do is just click on the accession number. And that will take us to this structure summary page. So again, the pictogram, the representation of our picture, the primary reference that describes the uh, solution of this particular structure. So in this case, this is an x-ray structure. Um, and just a link back to that reference if you want to read the paper. This comes from E. coli. And down below, we have a representation of what else we found in this particular protein. So our sequence is sequence A, the structure that we started with, 2LIV. It shows us some domains that were found below that exist in that particular protein. But what I'm going to do is use this uh, graphic as our jumping off to do the vast search. So we're going to now let the machine do this little vector alignment method to find what other structures are similar to the one that I've started with. So in order to do that, it's very simple. All you have to do is just click any place on the bar that is labeled sequence A. When you do that, you get this very, very busy slide. Um, your protein, the one that you started with, is right here, this bar at the top. And you'll notice below a bunch of sometimes continuous, sometimes discontinuous bars, each one labeled with a PDB identifier. So each one of these represents a protein deemed similar in structure to the one that you started with. What the discontinuities represent are places where you don't have structural overlap between the one you started with and the one that was found. So this is just a visual to convey to you, do I have a global alignment across the entire length of my protein, as we do in the first case, case with the exception of one residue, as you'll see in a moment? Or do I have something where I have domains in common? So that shows you some of the power of VAS. We don't have to force a global alignment same arguments we used last week about why we want to do local alignments versus global alignments, both at the sequence and the structure level. All right. And um, in a current protocols uh, reference I'm going to give you a little bit later, you can change how this looks to render it as a table. There are some statistical guidelines in that unit that I think would be useful to you in helping to um, decipher what these tables, uh, what these um, list of results actually should be interpreted. I want to instead, though, uh, focus on actually looking at this structure. So at the very top, you see a link that says View 3D Alignment. And if you click on that, this will launch a uh, viewer called CN3D, which stands for in 3 d I would have loved to have been in the planning meeting to come up with that name. All right. So you can download that software by following this link here. This will work on a Mac, a PC, a, a Linux box. But let's go ahead and launch CN3D. You've already seen this slide. And so here, um, we can 
change how the representation of this protein is, is, is rendered. Uh, in this case, the rendering is something called tubes, which is just the lines that you see. The coloring in this case I have set to identity. So in this case, there is only one mismatch of an A to a V between the two sequences, and that is this blue bit all the way here at the top. So the reds are the matches, the blues are the mismatches. I could take my cursor and just highlight any part of this sequence. It would light up the corresponding part of the sequence in yellow. By the same token, I could click on any part of the sequence, and it would light up the corresponding residue in the alignment below. So a really cool tool to find out where each particular residue actually lies. So you can start to think about things instead of just being a string of letters, not having any sense of how this thing folds. Now you kind of know, all right? And that's very important. Two other views of this that, that I think would be important, and again, the current protocols unit describes how to get these. Um, the first, and for each one of these, I'm sorry, the alignment's uh, a little schnooked here. For each one of these, there is a rendering setting and a coloring setting under something called the styles menu. The one on the left is what I like to call the seminar view because this is a very nice way to orient people in your audience to what your protein's structure is all about. You'll, um, so the settings for those are shown below. Um, in this structure, you see a bunch of green Crayola crayons. So what those crayons are are the alpha helices. The flat end is the N-terminal end. The pointed end is the C-terminal end. The brown bars are the beta strands. Again, flat end is the N-terminal. Pointed end is the C-terminal. So you can see how they are oriented throughout the structure. Now, certainly, we don't have proteins in the cell floating around with a bunch of Crayola crayons in them, so we have other ways to render this to get a more realistic representation. And so the one that is on the right is the space filling representation, the, the best approximation we can get using this tool of the true three-dimensional structure of this protein, the shape that is being presented in the cell. And so in this case, I've also colored this uh, using the charge setting, so any place you see blue, is a positive charge, any place you see red is a negative charge, everything else is neutral. And I've already told you that, um, that this is an iso leucine isoleucine valine binding protein, so you might be able to look at these charge distributions and see how they might point you towards a, a binding site or some other important part of the molecule that is actually involved in its uh, function. So, incredibly easy to use. I mean, as easy as it was for me to explain this to you, if you go back to your offices and actually sit down and do this, it is that easy to use, okay? So I would encourage you to do this because it's going to help you conceptualize better what your proteins of interest, the ones that you yourselves are working on in your laboratory are all about. You now have a sense of what's on the surface and what's buried and what might be in an active site or, or in, a, in a binding pocket or some catalytic site or something else that's important to what this particular entity actually does. So if you're doing experimental design, you make more intelligent choices now because you know where the binding sites are and other functional features are so you don't just do random site-directed mutagenesis to determine gain of function or loss of function. You can hone down your experiments a little bit better. Um, so please do take the time to, to avail yourselves of this, of this tool. It's incredibly useful and again, more importantly, will serve you very well in those instances where simple sequence comparisons just won't be up to the task. So some additional reading one more time. So I've alluded to this several times now. So this is a unit that I've written in, in uh, CPBI Unit 1.3 which talks about CN3D, which we talked about in this lecture. You'll have a little bit more information in there on how to make those views, but how to label them, how to export them, get them into your PowerPoint presentations, and so on. But also, for those of you who are interested, that um, unit takes you through a very rigorous overview of how to use Entree. I know most of you have probably used Entree at some point, but you probably know how to find those papers and maybe find a sequence and uh, maybe don't exactly know how to use Entree to its best advantage, the full power behind Entree. So I think that really you should consider as required reading, not just optional. Finally, the second one here is an introduction to modeling protein structure from sequence. We don't have time to talk about this today, but let's say you've done your vast search and you come up with nothing, that there is no other structure similar to the one that you're starting with. And remember, those comparisons are all of solved structures. We're not doing any de novo structure prediction there. 
So, but let's say you actually do want to do that, that you want to start to say, all right, I want to model my protein it uh, to see the effect of a mutation so I can just interchange a residue for another residue to see what would actually happen. There are a number of more advanced methods that allow you to do that, and this unit gives you an overview of those, those methods, what to use where, and where to find them. So I would encourage you to do that as well if uh, your research takes you in that direction. Okay, so now in the last 25 minutes, we're going to fly through uh, multiple sequence alignments. So, um, so it's important that we talk about this one. It puts a lot of the concepts we've gone through in the last lecture and a half, but it also will set us up for things in future lectures where you will see these alignments over and over again, whether it is in the context, again, of phylogenetic analyses, even starting next week when Tira starts to talk you, to you about the genome browsers and the various tracks on them. Those are, in, in essence, alignments, okay? So it's important to understand uh, where they come from. I realize that most of you have probably done them before, but I want to give you some general guidelines to make sure that you're um, performing them properly and to basically just bring your game up a notch to make sure you're, you're using these methods uh, in the most advantageous way. All right, so why do we even bother doing these things? What do we um, stand to gain? What can we learn by doing these multiple sequence alignments? So quite simply, they very often can allow us to uh, identify conserved regions and patterns and domains, all the things that we spent the first half of this morning speaking about. And again, as I've, I've beat on many times now, how those things can be to your advantage when you think about questions in experimental design and predicting the structure and function of a possibly unknown brand new protein that you've discovered uh, or to identify new members of a protein family. You absolutely have to do a multiple sequence alignment if you want to do a phylogenetic analysis. It is actually impossible to do it any other way because all of the phylogenetic methods depend on the construction of a multiple sequence alignment as its input. Okay, so it's not that you can just stick in a bunch of sequences and get back um, a tree. You have to actually start off with a multiple sequence alignment and then that alignment will be used to generate the tree. Um, we've already talked about the next point about using this uh, for uh, the generation of position-specific scoring matrices. And this also might bolster confidence if you've done secondary structure predict predictions. So we haven't talked about predicting alpha helices and beta strands in uh, either one of these two lectures, but let's say you have done that and the statistical support isn't very strong. If you do a multiple sequence alignment and see commonality in those secondary structural elements across a whole host of different proteins that you've aligned, then that gives you better confidence in those predictions as well. So again, the, the, the same spirit of sometimes in the laboratory you might have a result that you're not exactly sure of and you use another technique to verify, same game applies here. All right. So what do we need to consider when we do one of these multiple sequence alignments? Well, of course, we're looking for absolute sequence similarity. What we want to do in these alignments is in each column get as many absolutely conserved positions as possible, line up as many common characters as we can. Of course, as with our scoring matrices, we can't always have absolute conservation at each position. Sometimes we have conservative substitutions, so we take those into account as well. Finally, you may be lucky enough to have one of the sequences in your set where there is a known structure, and that information can also be used to fine-tune the alignment, to get, add greater support to the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate <laughs> multiple sequence alignment that you get. All right. Some general guidelines, things to keep in the back of your head as you do this yourselves. Um, we tend, once again, to concentrate on the protein level rather than on the nucleotide level, and that's just because it is more informative. There is more information content um, in protein side chains than there is by looking at just the chemistry of each of the individual nucleotides. That's just because of the, the different structure of each of the 20 amino acid side chains. So because of that, it's less prone to inaccurate alignments that so we're taking those physical, physicochemical properties into account. Uh, you can certainly translate these back to nucleotide sequences after doing the alignments. This certainly depends on the context that you're doing this in because you might be trying to align uh, nucleotide sequences where there are, is no protein translation. And we'll see examples of this when Laura Elnitsky gives her lecture in four weeks when she starts to talk about regulatory elements and um, uh, considerations in epigenetics. All right, some more guidelines. 
you need to use a reasonable number of sequences. So, so the, the temptation is to throw everything you have at the method, but that actually will start to work against you if you do that because this is a global alignment method. So again, we talked about global alignments last week. The more alignments you do, the longer it takes and the harder it, get, it, it gets. So most of the alignment algorithms start to fail when you try to line up too many sequences. And the truth is, you sort of reach a point of diminishing return where if you've gone from 40 sequences to 50 sequences, are you really learning anything more by adding that last 10 sequences? Chances are, if you've selected your sequences wisely at the beginning, you really don't have to have very huge input sets. Um, also, the phylogenetic studies that might arise from this are almost impossible to do. Uh, I remember once where I tried to do an alignment, uh, a, a phylogenetic tree on a set that had something like 130 sequences on it, and it took a month for the computer to finally get around to giving me an answer. So it, it becomes very, very um, computationally unreasonable. So good starting point, 10 to 15 sequences. That seems to be what folks like to use in the literature. Um, and your ballpark upper limit is around 50 before you start to see some of the problems um, that I've mentioned to you. All right, so that takes care of the number of sequences. What about the nature of the sequences? So because it's a global sequence alignment, again, it works best when you've got sequences of about the same length. Um, you want to use closely related sequences. Those will tell you what's, quote, required, what residues are absolutely conserved. If you use more divergent sequences, you can use those to study the evolutionary relationships in that group of sequences. So you want some of both. So for usually good starting point, sequences that tend to be 30 to 70% similar. So you have a fairly large birth to work in here. Um, but the last point is really the most important one, that the most informative alignments really come when you've got a combination of these, the closely related and divergent ones, things that are not too similar well, if they're all too similar, you're not going to learn anything. You already know from the single sequence pretty much what you have to, what you could find out if they're all almost exactly the same. But if they're too different, you then end up in a situation where you just computationally can't align them. So again, 10 to 15 as your starting point. Um, this should also be an iterative process where you start with that 10 to 15, do the alignment, see how it looks. So examine the quality of alignment. What I, what I mean by that is how many gaps are in the alignment? Remember, each one of those gaps represents a biological event, either an insertion or a deletion. So you have to keep those to a reasonable number. You just can't willy-nilly put them in. Um, if the alignment looks good, add some more. Do the alignment again. Just keep going in that fashion. If you see that the alignment is starting to break down, so for example, you might have just inserted a sequence that now is putting an inordinate amount of gaps in, just take that one out. Okay, so there's a, an element of fine tuning that you will learn over time. It, it, it's, it's actually rather intuitive. All right, now that's how to make them. How do you interpret them? So when you see a particular column in your multiple sequence alignments where you've got um, absolutely conserved positions, the, that indicates to you that those are required for proper structure and function. They have been conserved for a reason. When you see relatively well conserved positions, those are the ones where you can say, all right, I can tolerate a certain amount of change and not adversely, adversely affect the structure or function of the protein. Now, most people tend to concentrate on these looking at the commonalities, but I think it's actually quite interesting sometimes to look at the differences, the positions that are not conserved, because those are allowed to mutate freely, and this is really sort of the source of evolutionary innovation, where mother nature can actually come up with uh, changes in those proteins that can be tolerated because the original function is supported, but maybe start to develop new proteins that have slightly different uh, functions in the cell. All right. If you see gap-free blocks, those are usually regions of secondary structure, alpha helices or beta strands, because you just can't have a gap in one of those. If you see gap-rich blocks, those are usually unstructured regions or the loop regions. Okay, that is what it is. All right, so enough of that. How do we actually do this? The method I'm going to describe to you today is something called Clustal W, and so this also comes from uh, the folks at the Sanger Institute, and this just very simply allows you to take a sequence set of interest and do your multiple sequence alignment. There's a standalone version that you can download. The web-based version, though, is, is very nice, and that's the one I'm going to show you, and then you don't also have to worry about do I have the latest version. 
Um, so how does this actually work? Again, to get us away from the bl black box, a little bit of background. So uh, what this is using is a method called the progressive alignment method. So regardless of the number of sequences that I start with, it's going to only align two sequences at a time. It's not going to attempt to align them all at the same time. And building on these pairs of alignments, it's going to gradually build up the multiple sequence alignment, clustering them on the basis of similarity. It's going to use the same kind of matrices that we talked about last week, the same kind of affine gap penalties to calculate the alignments that have the best score. By doing it this way, there's two major advantages. One, it's incredibly fast. And the alignments are generally of very, very high quality. So that's why I, I, I like to use this um, kind of method with some caveats. All right, so what does this actually mean when we say progressive alignment? So here's a, uh, a sequence set that I put together, four sequences, A, B, C, and D. And in the first step, what I want to do is just calculate how identical each one of these is to all of the others. So A to B, B to C, C to D, and so on. And again, with apologies for the alignments here, in order to do that, it um, will do all of these alignments there it, because of this equation here that dictates how many alignments have to be done based on the number of sequences. If we have four sequences, it results in six alignments. But as you can see, the numbers get pretty big as we go down. So if you've got 100 sequences, you're up at 5,000 alignments. And this sort of drives home what I was saying a little bit earlier about the set being a little too big. All right, so here are our four sequences again. I've computed my scoring matrix. Um, so A, B, C, and D going across the top. A, B, C, and D going down the bottom. Across the diagonal is the comparison to self. So of course they are 100% identical to themselves. But now I'm just going to look for the largest numbers in the table to see which ones of these are most related to the others. So what I see here is A is most related to B, 80%. C is most related to D, 92%. So I'm going to treat A and B together and C and D together. So A and D share greater similarity with each other than C or D. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take A and B and align them with each other, create an alignment called AB, and I'm going to fix that. Same thing with C and D. Align those two, fixed alignment. Now, in the next step, I'm going to take that fixed alignment of A and B and align that with this fixed alignment of C and D. All right? So we're now using these blocks of alignments and aligning the alignments to each other. And we just do that as many times as we have to until we get all of the sequences into the alignment. Okay, so we start with individual sequences, we build these little sub-alignments, we align the sub-alignments with each other. Now, so what that allows you to do is, because we're starting where there is the greatest amount of identity, we do the easy ones first, okay? And we use that information that we build along the way to, to inform how to do the harder alignments. So not that different than the philosophy that we used in Cyblast. We start finding the things that are common and then using those collective characteristics to build out. The problem with that, though, is there, if there is an error in the initial alignment and you fixed it, you're going to propagate that error throughout the alignment. So uh, what is nice in this new version of Clustal 2 and why I like this over some other of the progressive alignment methods is it allows something called a remove first um, uh, step where you can actually backtrack and take things out and put things in and it will recalculate to improve the alignments. And I'll show you how to throw those flags when we get to the screens. All right. So what do we get? Well. Uh, once we do that, we get the scores that are used to inform how to do this buildup of the alignment. Uh, luckily, we get a multiple sequence alignment out. That's the whole point. We also get two tree-based representations. One is called a cladogram. And this is just that built-up tree that I showed you. What sequences were aligned together to put that um, multiple sequence alignment, to construct that multiple sequence alignment. So it's, it's an estimate of phylogeny. The branches are all of equal length. It gives you some idea of common ancestry, but you don't have branch lengths that gives you an indication of evolutionary time. The phylogram is basically the same idea, but now you do, the branch lengths do vary here to give you at least a visual idea proportionally of how much evolutionary change has taken place over time. Um, you will get back conservation patterns. So um, when you see the colors on the various alignments, 
This is the scheme that it uses to determine what is a conservative substitution. So the aromatics are all grouped together, the positively charged residues, the negatively charged residues, and some other classes that are common to endothelices, uh, catalytic sites, and of course cysteine um, is in a special class of its own because of its role in maintaining those cysteine cross bridges that are very important to structure and function. Um, the interpretation here is empirical. So I don't have numbers to point you to, as I have with the other methods, to give you some general starting points for cutoffs and, and similar considerations. Um, so the interpretation here is strictly empirical. What you will get back for each column in your alignment, at the bottom of each column, you'll have see one of these three marks or just a space. If you see a star, that is an entirely conserved column. So you want to see those stars in at least 10% of the positions across your alignment to, to consider that to be a good alignment. And that's a generally accepted indication of a good alignment. Conservation is dictated by those groups that I just showed you. So if you um, have only residues in those groups at a particular position, you'll see the colon here according to that color table. This one's a little interesting. If you just see a dot, this is what they have come up with calling semi-conserved. So that just means you have residues from two of those conserved classes, but no more than two of those conserved classes. So really, the ones you should focus in on are the first two here. Um, this is just the coloring table. You can look at that on your own. Here's the screens that I want to focus on. So, um, so starting off, first thing I want to show you is where it says matrix. Right now it says default is the default, but we have, as before, choices here. So we spent most of our time last week talking about the blossom matrices. I mentioned the PAM matrices. You'll notice, though, that there is no number here. So remember last week, Blossom 62, Blossom 80, Blossom 30, and so on. What the method will do is pick the appropriate matrix, depending on which sequences it's trying to align. So it will change them as it goes through your sequence set. So I usually pick Blossom there. Um, the other thing I want to show you here is what's in the red box is how you control that remove first. All right, so that so you don't end up in a statistical minimum where you've made a wrong alignment that propagates through your tree. You can use um, these settings to dictate when that um, procedure takes place. If you pick tree under iteration, it will happen at each and every step, more computationally intensive, but it probably uh, is the safer bet. If you leave it on alignment, it'll only do it in the final step. The number of iterations defaults at three. Again, just bump it up all the way to 10. Um, down, whoops, down below, I've just pasted five sequences in, in here. These are all FOS proteins, and these are also on that web page that you have for you to do your practice from. So at this point, I would click Run down at the bottom here, and this is what I get. So at the top, just a series of links that will allow me to jump around my page. Um, right below, I just have all of my scores that were used to inform how this particular uh, alignment was constructed. If I scroll down, here's my alignment. After all of that, finally, you have the alignment according to the color table in your handout. OK, I'll show you how to change this momentarily. Going further down the page, here is the cladogram, so you can get a sense of how the alignment was constructed, but also some sense of phylogenetic relationships. Again, the cladogram doesn't give you any sense of evolutionary distance. If you click on phylogram, it will recast it into this format where you now have a better sense of evolutionary distance. This is not a phylogenetic tree, okay? I will show you how to make it. That's not it, though, so remember that, okay? How are we going to get there? How are we going to make that tree? We're going to use a tool called Jalview, and this is a Java applet that can be used to manually edit your alignments. So let's say the method has created the alignment, but you want to fiddle with it. You want to move things a little bit over. You might have a reason to, to say, well, this residue should really be aligned in this column rather in this, than in this column. So you can actually have some fine control. You can change the colors. You can do uh, consensus sequence ca calculations. And more importantly, second from the bottom, that's where we're going to finally make our phylogenetic trees. So to get to the Jalview applet, there is a button on the top of your results page that says Start Jalview, and if you click on that, you get a new window popping up that looks like this. So on the next several slides, up at the top here, I'm going to give you a path. The menus are in these teeny, tiny, barely visible, like one-point type here at the top, uh, but I just want you to know where those are. All right, so here's your default view. Our five FOSS sequences going from one to the end. 
Three histograms to indicate to you the quality of your alignment. The first line says conservation, so this is just how uh, an indication of percent identity, how identical is that position. Uh, that goes hand in hand with uh, the alignment quality, so these usually parallel each other. And finally, at the bottom, you see a consensus sequence. In some positions, you'll see a plus sign, and those are just positions where no consensus sequence could be reliably determined. All right. Now, so that's my default view. Let's play with this. So first one, if I go to these menus, go to the color menu, and then pick percent identity, the color scheme changes to these shades of blue. Here's what the shades of blue correspond to. So why this is useful to you is this very quickly allows you to find motifs in your own alignment that are putatively important. So I, when you do this, you should look for blocks of high or absolute sequence identity. And what that is going to tell you is what parts of the, these sequences have had on them some sort of evolutionary pressure to not change, Okay, to keep those residues conserved. Let's change it one more time. So now we go to the calculate menu in this teeny tiny menu here and then just ask for a pairwise alignment. Before doing that, I've highlighted two of the sequences here, FOSS from chick, FOSS from mouse. I click on pairwise alignment and there's my pairwise alignment of the two to each other and it will also give me a sense of the percent identity as well. All right, let's do it again. So now this time, let's say I select all of my sequences, I go to the calculate menu, I ask it to calculate a tree, there are four choices there. The one that I picked is something called neighbor joining using Blossom 62. And here now is our first phylogenetic tree, OK? So this shows you the relationship between the five species here, the five sequences. Uh, who, so mouse being most related to human, rat being most related to mouse, and so on. You can overlay uh, evolutionary distance information, bootstrap values, and stuff on these to get a sense of the quality of your um, phylogenetic tree. So I, I like this a lot because it's integrated in with the multiple sequence alignment generation. You don't have to take your data off to another program to make those trees, but this will only take you so far. Some of the more advanced tree building methods have many, many more options available to you where you can fine tune what these alignments look like and uh, dictate how many times it should recalculate the trees and so on. So in the last two minutes. Uh, so once more, further reading, there's an entire unit in CPBI on Clustal W. Again, examples for you to work through. There's another method that I want to point your attention called tea coffee. Everything we did in the example just now relied on sequence data to construct the alignment. What tea coffee will do is if there is a structure available for any of the sequences in your set, it will use that information to better construct the alignment. So again, using that three-dimensional information to give you a better alignment at the end of the day. So with all of that, hopefully now over the last three hours, um, you've started to gain some appreciation for why some of the basic understanding of what underlies these methods is important. I know many of you have used the methods before, but have probably just, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the first lecture, stuck the sequence in the box, clicked on blast or clicked on go, and gotten your results back. But I, there are things that you need to be mindful of to make sure you use these methods to their best advantage. Hopefully I've given you some hints you can take away with you to use them to your best advantage, and more importantly, to avoid some of the pitfalls that others have fallen into. Um, it doesn't require a hardcore understanding of the techniques. As you see, we didn't go into any math. All right, I've shown you an equation here and there, but we haven't really discussed them. It's just that you have a general understanding of how they work so you make the best choices so that you don't, again, you treat this as the black box where the sequence comes in, results come out, and you just trust them, okay? And the thing is, what I'm telling you is use them in an intelligent fashion. Inspect the results to make sure that what you... Uh, based on what I've told you over the last two lectures, they make sense from a computational standpoint, but they also make sense in the context of the biology that you already know. When you put those two things together, that will always serve you incredibly well, okay? So I leave you with that. A reminder about next week's lecture, Tira Wolfsburg will pick up for me from, uh, from here. We're going to move to a more decidedly genomic point of view next week where Tira will be giving you information and giving you a very, very nice overview of how to use the various genome browsers to mine genomic data. All right, so uh, I'll be happy to take any questions down at the podium. Thanks once again for coming.